Hello, everyone. You're listening to the award-winning podcast, The Social Contract, now in its second season. I'm Tavia. I'm George. I'm Cleo. And I'm Ayanique. Welcome to this episode of The Social Contract, the new way to Saturday. Indeed, Ayanique. New episodes of The Social Contract will be dropping on the last Saturday of each month. So I hope our growing legion of younger listeners will add this podcast to their Saturday morning routine. But for this, our season two premiere, we wanted to launch today, President's Day. Especially since the new season is based on George and Cleo's new book, Presidential Conversations for Kids. What better day than President's Day to make our first two episodes available? As in the book, this season of the podcast follows 10-year-old BFFs Georgie and Gigi as they travel through time on a magical skateboard meeting U.S. presidents throughout history. In each episode, the two Gs will encounter a different president on their exciting adventure and learn a lesson in leadership from each. In today's episode, we'll learn all about Georgie and Gigi. And our first president, George Washington, will be introduced. Broadway star and celebrated narrator Stephen DeRosa voices all the characters, including Georgie and Gigi. And you'll also be hearing from George, Cleo, Ionique, and me, Tavia. We're so excited, and we hope you are too. Now, I want to welcome our newest addition to the Social Contract podcast, Ionique Kelly. Ionique is 11 years old. She's originally from Las Vegas in the great state of Nevada, but recently relocated to Los Angeles to pursue her acting and singing career. In addition to joining The Social Contract this season, Ionique will soon be seen in a co-starring guest spot on Abbott Elementary. I love that show. Let's check in with Ionique now. Hi, Ionique. It is so wonderful to have you with us on the podcast. Welcome. It is a delight to have you with me. This is season two, and since this season is based on the book Presidential Conversations for Kids, we call it PC4K, I understand that the very first thing you did to prepare was to read the book. So I'm curious, what did you think? Uh, the book was very nice, and me personally, I would give it a five out of five star review. I really like the book. I really like how it talks about all presidents like George Washington, Barack Obama, and the new president. Um, what, what's his name? Oh, that would be Joseph Biden or President Biden. Yes. <laughs> Were there any parts of the book or any presidents that really stuck out to you or you thought that's my favorite president, that is my guy? Barack Obama, since he was like the first black person to be elected president. He's the one that mostly like stuck out to me. Mm, yes. I remember the night that he was elected, I was jumping up and down in the street, literally like in the middle of the street. That was an amazing, amazing moment. So you were probably not even born when Barack Obama was elected president, were you? No, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so cool. Yeah, he was a transformative president. So I'm not surprised that he was a favorite for you. I know that your favorite singer of all time is Whitney Houston. I love Whitney Houston, too. Like Whitney, you have dazzled audiences singing the Star Spangled Banner, which is a really, really difficult song to sing. So I want to know, how did you discover our national anthem? And tell me about performing that. Where did you perform that song? Uh, so... I first discovered the Star Spangled Banner when my mother played Whitney Houston's version, which, by the way, I absolutely love. It's phenomenal. When I first heard it, it was I was just blown out the water, and it was, like, super good. And I've sung the national anthem a lot of times at my brother's high school in Nevada, and to this day, I still practice the national anthem. It's very, it is a very hard to song to sing, like you said, and for me, the notes were, like, gradually coming at me so it, it was like a lot to take in at the same time with the key range and everything yeah 
It's really hard. I mean, the range of notes is really extreme. So that is a song that we all as Americans may know, but we cannot all sing all of those notes. So tell me what that song means to you. Like when you sing it, what are you feeling as you're performing that incredible song? Um, the national anthem means to me like freedom mm -hmm. from like all the wars and shoulders. I mean, sorry, uh, soldiers who have gone MIA. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that you've sung that a number of times at your brother's high school. Are there other places that you've sung that song? Um, no, not currently. Instead of like in front of my mother, I have sang it in front of her. <laughs> but rather than that, like a high school. Our moms are our best fans. I have a lot of respect for that. Is there somewhere you dream of singing the Star Spangled Banner? Um, I guess at the Super Bowl. Ooh, I want to see you sing that song at the Super Bowl someday. Okay, I'm putting it out to the universe. Maybe we'll say like 15 years from now. How about that? Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, something that I'm super excited about, and I know that our listeners will be really excited about, is that later this season, we get to see you on Abbott Elementary, which is a show I absolutely love. I want to tell you, congratulations. I know it's top secret, but can you tell us anything about your role and the experience working on that show? I bet it was super, super exciting. Thank you, and the co-star role that I played was Choir Kid number three. The experiment was amazing. I got to meet Quinta Brunson, Tyler J. Williams, uh, Shirley Ralph, Lisa, who plays Melissa, and Jacob. I also got a fist bump from all of them, and my friend was also on the show, so mm. me and him, yeah, me and him got to like work together, and we also sang Wind Beneath My Wings by Bette Midler. <gasps> And yeah, wow. it was amazing working on the set. That is so cool. Yes. You weren't just on the show. You got to sing one of the most beautiful songs by a diva, Bette Midler. That's so awesome. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Well, I hope that we will not only see you one time. I hope that we get to see you many, many times and I will personally look forward to it. I, Anique Kelly, everyone. Now, before we get to our story, I wanted to hear from one of this podcast's creators, the author of PC for K, George S. Corey, and how he and Cleo, who we'll also hear from later, came up with the name The Social Contract. First off, I'd like to take a moment to thank you, Tavia, for the tremendous job you've done anchoring the podcast in season one. Cleo and I are just so grateful, and we're extremely excited about this new direction we're taking for the second season. And Cleo and I are beyond impressed with Miss Ionique Kelly. How wonderful to have her and you with us this season. Now, I've spent most of my life studying history and the United States Constitution. And for me, the single most important part of our democracy is the social contract. It may sound like a fancy idea, but it's really quite simple and very cool. It really just means respecting one another. When members of a society, our society, work together and with their leaders to create a better society for all of us. And we can do so in little ways, every day. For instance, instead of going for that second slice of cake at a birthday party, you may want to leave it for someone else or if you see a classmate or a teacher accidentally drop some money on the floor, pick it up and give it back to them. Those small things add up, and that's how you build character. It not only makes you a good person, but also a good citizen. Well said, George. I couldn't agree more. Now, let's kick it over to Stephen as we embark on this wild adventure together. Oof! Georgie cried out as he stuck the landing on his skateboard. The bright red supreme longboard with a faded blue smurf in sunglasses stenciled on its nose was Georgie's prized possession. Ten-year-old George, everyone called him Georgie, was now the first in his class to flip his board onto the rail and ride it down the front steps of the elementary school building. It was the last day of fourth grade. School was out and summer was here. 
So Georgie, naturally, decided to exit the school building in trailblazing style. Georgie already had a lot of firsts under his belt. He was the first in his class to get straight A's. Okay, he got a B plus in math. He was always the first kid to get picked for athletic teams. Well, except for basketball. Georgie was fast, but also short. He was even the first kid in his family, older brother to his twin sisters, Abigail and Dolly. Georgie may have been destined to be number one at many things, because his parents, both history teachers, had named him after the first president of the United States, George Washington. Plus, they just really liked the name George. Georgie's classmates cheered and whooped, even some of the fifth grade kids. But Georgie played it cool. He raised two fingers in a peace sign and motioned to his BFF, Gigi. Let's get out of here, G, he said. Already by your side, G, Gigi replied. They bumped fists and rode away on their boards. Gigi's board was purple, and she had traced hearts all over it in different colors. She called it heart art and got a kick out of how that rhymed. Her name was Giselle. It had been passed down over multiple generations of her family, which came from the French West Indies. But everybody called her Gigi. Well, everyone except Georgie. He called her G, and she called him G. And they thought that was pretty cool. While George was a top banana at school and sports, Gigi wasn't crazy about school except for drama club, and hated sports, except for skateboarding, which she loved. Gigi thought of herself as a star in the making, and true to that vision, usually landed a leading role in school plays. She always wore her black hair in two pom-pom buns, and after she celebrated her 10th birthday, she was allowed to wear clear lip gloss and glitter nail polish, also clear. So, for a suburban fourth grader, Gigi had star quality. But she still managed to be way down to earth and liked to keep it real, as she was fond of saying. As they glided down the sidewalk on their boards enjoying the Astro Pops, Georgie noticed a huge rip in Gigi's jeans. Wow, Georgie exclaimed. You really tore your jeans out. Yeah, trying to flip my board and ride it down the steps just like you did when you made your grand exit. Do not try this at home, kids, joked Georgie. Leave it to us pros. Yeah, whatever. I'm convinced your board's got some kind of magical voodoo power. I bet if you let me ride it, I could do two flips and ride it down the steps. No way, G. Aw, oh, come on, please. No. S'il vous plaît? Georgie laughed. Well, now that you asked in French, I'll think about it. The two Gs fist bumped. Oh, hey, do you want to come over for dinner tonight? Georgie asked. Marie's in town, and she's making kibbe. Kibbe? As in my favorite Middle Eastern food? Oh, I am there. Then we can hit the skate park. Marie was Georgie's Egyptian grandmother. Her official name was Grandma Marie. But Georgie and Gigi, who was Grandma Marie's favorite of the neighborhood kids, referred to her simply as Marie between themselves. Grandma Marie was cool. Whenever she visited, she played old school board games like Scrabble and Battleship with Georgie and his friends. A former star forward on her all-girls Catholic high school basketball team, she'd even shot hoops with the kids. And she was an amazing cook. Her kibbeh were football-shaped meatballs made with beef, onions, pine nuts, and cracked wheat. Marie deep-fried them, refusing to bake her kibbe just to make the moms happy. And sometimes, she'd take Georgie, Gigi, and their friends out for french fries and milkshakes. Georgie and Gigi especially loved the exotic dishes she prepared. She also made a mean grilled cheese. Georgie's parents were attending an academic symposium in Albuquerque. He knew how to spell Albuquerque, thanks to prep for the recent interscholastic spelling bee but still wasn't quite sure how to pronounce it. He was just stoked that his parents took the twins with them and that he was getting to kick off summer vacay with a feast of his favorite Middle Eastern comfort food with two of his favorite people, Grandma Marie and Gigi.
I'm glad you have a friend like Gigi, Georgie's grandmother told him. She's nice and smart. She laughs at your jokes and makes you laugh too. That's important. And she likes skateboarding too, exclaimed Georgie. She's definitely my BFF. I thought I was your BFF, Grandma Marie joked. You're both my BFF, Georgie replied diplomatically. That night at dinner, Georgie and Gigi excitedly shared their summer plans with Grandma Marie. They envisioned a summer filled with fun, adventure, a few beach trips, and lots of skateboarding. And your summer reading list, Grandma Marie reminded them. Oh yeah, that too, Georgie reassured his grandmother. The two G's hung on to every word Grandma Marie said as she served them her famous Egyptian sugar cookies and poured two glasses of cold milk for them. You two are growing up so fast. And in a few months, you'll be starting fifth grade. You certainly aren't kiddos anymore. You're kids. Later, as they rushed to the skate park before it got dark, Georgie and Gigi agreed that Grandma Marie was right. They weren't kiddos. They were kids. Suddenly, it felt like summer was full of endless possibilities. The skate park was filled with kids of all ages. There were even some teenagers, but they mostly kept to themselves with a too cool for school attitude. The younger kids all wore protective gear thanks to the parents. And just to be on the safe side, there was always a parental monitor to make sure the kids were properly padded up. Wrist and shin guards, knee pads, sometimes goggles, and of course, helmets. The kids personalized their protective gear just like they did their boards, especially the helmets. On any given day at the skate park, one could observe a sea of vibrant colors, mohawk tufts, blinking lights, and in Gigi's case, a purple glittery globe of a helmet adorned with hearts and peace signs. There were even separate lanes for skateboarding, BMX, scooter, wheelchair, and aggressive inline skating. Gigi breezed by and did a perfect kickflip on her first try. She was fearless. Georgie loved that about her. Cool, shouted Georgie. You think that was cool? Check this out. Gigi then did a heel flip. Not as perfect, but still clean. She giggled, exhilarated, and bent down to tighten her shoelaces. Georgie whizzed by on his longboard and invited Gigi to hop on. Seriously? She said. Yeah, take it for a spin, G, Georgie said with a smile. Georgie stepped off and allowed his BFF to mount his longboard. Let's go! He cried as he gave her a push. Suddenly, they picked up wicked speed and whoosh! Launched straight into the sky. Whoa, what's happening, G? Cried Gigi. I don't know, G. Maybe this thing is magical. As they flew through the sky, the longboard felt like it was attached to the bottoms of their feet. Strangely, neither of them was afraid of falling. It was too exhilarating. A freezing rainstorm began beating down, making it difficult for them to see ahead of them. Then, splash! They were gently but abruptly dropped into the frigid waters of the Delaware River. It was Christmas night, 1776, and none other than General George Washington was coming to their rescue. That's quite a cliffhanger. I cannot wait to find out what happens with Georgie, Gigi, and George Washington in our next episode, which thankfully you don't have to wait for. You can listen to it right after this one. But first... Our very own artist-in-residence, Cleo, has not only inspired this podcast and the book on which it's based, PC4K, but she makes it all beautiful. One of the most fantastic things that Cleo has created, especially for this project, is a series of word art illustrations. Each episode transcript this season will feature word art by Cleo that embodies the spirit of that episode. There's also an art gallery on our just-launched website where you can enjoy Cleo's word art. And guess what? Some of the words are on skateboards. Let's hear from Cleo as she shares her inspirations. 
freedom, courage, hope, truth. These are more than words. They are foundational ideals upon which our nation is built. Working on this project has been a powerful reminder of that for me. I hope my word art will encourage readers to reflect on these values that have made America exceptional. I hope my art will inspire you. Most of all, I hope seeing it will bring joy and happiness and make the words come alive. That brings us to the conclusion of our season two kickoff episode. We welcome you to follow The Social Contract wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Episode two is available now and new episodes drop on the last Saturday of the month. It's the new way to Saturday. So we hope you'll catch us next on March 25th. In the meantime, check out our website at www.mytscpodcast.com where there's a whole bunch of fun content for you to engage with. The Social Contract Podcast is created by George S. Corey and Cleo. Produced and hosted by Tavia Gilbert. Music courtesy of Listen Audio. Mix and Master by Kayla Elrod. Additional dialogue editing by Kathleen Conti. Social Manager Suzette Burton. Production Coordinator Tatiana Bacchus. This has been a podcast from Listen Audio in association with Talkbox Productions. On behalf of George, Cleo, Stephen, Ionique, and me, Tavia, thank you for listening.